Well, I'm Cliff Revor. Uh, just a few brief uh, comments about myself. My father was a First World War veteran, fought over near Verdun with the American Expedition <coughs> War in 1918, and stayed between the wars in uh, Europe with the American government. I was born in Portugal in 41 while they were waiting for transportation back to the U.S. And we went back over uh, to Bella Wood, and some of you may have heard of it, if you were, particularly if you were in the Marines. Uh, and that's where I lived, uh, 50 miles outside of Paris, uh, from 5 until I was uh, 20. So I went to French schools, English as a foreign language, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, came over, uh, got in the Air Force, and that's where I got my Computer programming, I was very fortunate to be assigned and learn computer programming in the Air Force. The, some of you may remember seeing vacuum tubes. Uh, and I programmed computers when they had vacuum tubes. The operating system was nothing, it was, didn't exist. In it, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so that's briefly my, uh, uh, where I come from. And then I went, after getting out to the Air Force, I went to IBM and uh, worked in classified areas and also uh, with GPS in 1980 uh, when the implementation of GPS was started. Now, GPS goes back to uh, 1977 where they started to launch a few GPS satellites to do a proof of concept to see if it would in fact work. And uh, that was proven that it was feasible, a very basic uh, capability, and in 1980, we started to do an implementation of GPS. Uh, I was a system engineer, uh, software engineer, and was responsible for developing the onboard GPS uh, program for the GPS computer on the satellite. And then took over the department to implement that uh, by design, as well as working on various other functions in the control segment. Now, GPS is Global Positioning System, that's what it stands for, and it basically means that you can navigate anywhere in the terrestrial environment. Now, I use terrestrial environment because uh, that also applies to, let's say, if you're 30,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. Now, put that in perspective, the space station is normally between 120 to 200 miles. So we're talking about way out there. Uh, and of course, right down to the surface of the Earth. Composed of three uh, segments mainly. Of course, you've got the user segment, which is by far the most people. And you've got the satellites. And then you've got the control segment, which is responsible for the GPS satellites and making sure the uh, data coming down is what is needed by the users. And GPS really is a very, very simple concept. Uh, you know, it's the old train leaves station A at uh, one o'clock, it's the station B at two, 60 miles an hour, how far is it from station A to station B? And that is the basic building block of GPS. If you've got one satellite, then you've got basically a uh, circumference where the, use, the solution will be valid. Uh, you know, time distance is right. The satellites, of course, are on, the, the, our, excuse me, the transmitters are on the GPS satellites, which makes station A a moving target and adds some real spice <laughs> to uh, figuring out the solution. You've got two satellites. Now you're at the intersection where those two spheres meet. Again, time distance of arrival for both of them. Three satellites. You're down to actually two locations on that. Uh, so unless you're terribly lost, uh, you can eliminate one. And by terribly lost, uh, the satellites are about 11,000 miles up, so you're either above or below them. <laughs> Most people know whether they're above or below them. <laughs> uh, now, what GPS does, and some of you may remember 
go make a Xerox instead mm -hmm. of go make a copy. Yeah. Uh, GPS has got that same kind of uh, connotation because GPS only provides you with a point in time. That's all it provides you with. Anything else is user set application uh, that you know, then provides you distance, provides you coordinates over the map, and all kinds of other things. Uh, and from a GPS perspective in the Earth environment, you're, of course, relationship to the equator, relationship to origin zero, and how high above the uh, basically center of the Earth. Uh, you know, then you have to translate from there. But of course, you need to know where the satellites are located and the exact time. Now, okay, if there's any questions, just raise your hand up. Please don't hold them to the end. We'll try to answer them. If I say something that doesn't make any sense, also. Correctly. <laughs> but the GPS satellites are very uh, unique in the manner that most satellites go around in a elliptical orbit. However, an elliptical orbit is very difficult to describe in a consistent manner and with relatively few number of parameters. You, of course, obviously can, they know where the satellites are located and they can do that, but it takes a lot more computation. Therefore, the GPS satellites go around in a nearly perfectly circular orbit and they go around in 11 hours and 58 minutes, so they go around twice a day. Uh, which means that the uh, insertion into orbit, which is of course done by the Air Force, is a lot more complicated uh, than get the adjustments in that to get it to a close to circular orbit. Yes? Uh, uh, can the uh, satellites correct their own orbits? Pardon? Can the satellites correct their own orbits over time, or? Uh, they do have the ability to move in the orbits. Uh, the GPS satellites are grouped into, I believe now they're up to six racetrack orbits around the Earth, which puts four satellites in each orbit, not necessarily all operational because they have reserve satellites. Uh, and their orbits are 60 degrees inclined to the equator, which does mean that over the poles you have somewhat less coverage than you do over the equator where you get the most uh, triangulation, the biggest triangulation. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. But moving from one orbit to the other, uh, they can't do, they can just adjust their position within the orbit. Because it'll decay over time, that's why I was curious. Uh, at that altitude, there's not much decay. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, not, not, you figure a lot of your satellites are in the 100, 200, 300 mile, so you've got a lot more gravity pull and you've got residual particles of air up there, but you get uh, 11,000 miles up and there's not much up there anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, give you an idea, the uh, geosynchronous satellites that you hear about for radio communication and uh, you know, weather and all that, those are in a orbit that's exactly over the equator and they're called geosynchronous because in relationship to the position on Earth, they don't move. But they're about, uh, I think it's 22, 23,000 miles away. Okay. Now, uh, time is also a critical element uh, of this. Now, when we talk about time, let's talk about precision. Uh, a runner, you know, hundredth of a second, now they're getting down to a thousandth of a second, but that's still plenty accurate for the speed of a runner. Or a race car for that matter. A hundred, uh, thousands of, you know, thousands of a second is good enough to measure the speed. Uh, however, they're very, very slow compared to the speed of our train, which is uh, about 186,000 miles a second. Uh, so, the accuracy required is very, very high. We're talking about having to have an accuracy beyond nine digits 
below the second. And the more accuracy, the more digits you can carry, and the more digits you can, you're willing to compute, and of course that takes a lot of compute power, the further you get down to those bigger numbers, uh, the more accuracy you'll get. But um, that, I'm sure, is bringing up uh, some questions on, wait a minute, uh, how do you synchronize your clocks? Mm. On the satellites, it's relatively easy because they have atomic clocks. And I say relatively easy. Some of you I know realize this, but time. Is that something that's common? No. no. Okay. Relative. Uh, pardon? It's relative. And it, it does uh, vary at fairly low speeds. Uh, the way it was demonstrated was at Andrews, back in the 60s, they mounted, they had two atomic clocks, one on the ground and one in a transport. And it was synced by laser. On the ground, they were perfect sync. Transport going up and down the Potomac, I mean, going up and down Chesapeake Bay, you know, just a few miles off of Andrews. They could vary the synchronization by varying the speed of that transport. So uh, when you're talking about 7, 1,900 miles an hour, there is a speed or a clock de degradation. And that correction has to be provided to the satellites so they can provide an adjusted clock to the user. Now, you don't have, I sure don't have an atomic clock mm -hmm. on my watch, but I need that atomic clock accuracy. And this is where uh, the requirement for actually four satellites comes in mm. through some math that I don't even pretend <laughs> to understand. Uh, they, now, some of you may have some better information on this, so please speak up. But, uh, 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 the, you, the, the calculators that you've got in your cell phones or on your GPS car are using multiple satellites, four or more, to calculate time to atomic clock precision. Because if they don't, uh, you don't know which stage you're gonna be in, let alone which side of the highway. And today, uh, your user sets are accurate to uh, which side of the highway you're on. So th those are some of the things that from a simple concept, the implementation is uh, quite a challenge. <laughs> now, the way the user set knows where the satellite is, is by computing the orbit. Now, the user set transmits a signal, and each satellite transmits their own signal. It's a fairly slow signal. And the that's the reason that when you turn your navigation system on and it hasn't been turned on for several days or you've moved a significant distance, it takes a while for that first solution to come up. And the user set transmits a what we call a five um, part message. Each part has ten words in it. Uh, and the first three parts of the message contain very accurate navigational, uh, there's 11 parameters that will be plugged in to a orbital computation that will enable your set to determine where the satellite was. The first piece of the uh, message is the atomic clock time, date and time that the satellite transmitted that message. So the last thing it does before transmitting the message is plugging the time and kicks the message out. So you know the time that the signal was transmitted. You now can compute, because if you've got the 11 parameters, the exact location of where the satellite was when, you, when the satellite transmitted the message. You know your time that you received the message. So now you can compute how far you are from that satellite. Now, uh, 
some of you may have, well, when you look at your GPS receiver, uh, there are ways to determine how many satellites you're in fact monitoring. The, sat the your receiver has to compute for each of those satellites where it is in space. So it is very, very uh, computational intensive. That's why that if you ever get into a situation where you don't need your navigation system and you want to conserve your batteries, turn off your location computations. Because whilst your phone or whatever is just sucking up power doing all those computations and unless you need them it may be better to save battery power yeah, if you have to. It's just a little point of interest there. Uh, yeah, circular Circular where we talked about that uh, 12,500 uh, altitude and if you think about it that's the earth has only got a radius of about four, uh, less than 4,000 miles so it's three times the radius of the Earth that they're out there. International Space Station, it varies. Uh, recently it was fairly low, but I can't get up to that altitude, but it's, it's a fairly low orbit compared to the rest of the stuff. Uh, yeah, speed of uh, 66. Six, I've already covered uh, the inclinations of the equator, 12 hour orbits, and each has the atomic clock. Well, Thank you so much, Cliff, okay. for being part of this. And that was really awesome. Yay!